For Those Who Are Politically Wise, a show about the lives of Christians in Ohio involved with politics. Introducing your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Greetings, my fellow patriots, saints, and sinners. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. At the end of the show, there will be a blessing. Don't miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Do you pray for a politician? Do you think a politician can be a Christian? Do you think politicians should stand up for Christian principles? Do you think politicians should pray together? Do you want to see more Christians in politics? If you said yes to any of these questions, then you may be politically wise. Subscribe to Politically Wise on Facebook or on YouTube. Thank you. The opinions and statements on this show belong to those who give them. The rest of the show belongs to Thomas Wise Words, all rights reserved. Thank you for listening today. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Hello, my listeners. This is Reverend Thomas Wise, and the show is called Politically Wise. We have a very important election coming up here in Ohio, and it's dealing with issue three, and actually really kind of issue two, but it's about the legalization of marijuana. And I want to share my heart with you listeners that this is just such a bad thing, and that there's today's show, we're going to talk with a with a young man who I know is a man of integrity and that he's going to talk to us about the business side of this and how is it going to affect our businesses and how is this going to affect our community. And so, my friend, would you please introduce yourself to my listeners? Yes, thank you, Reverend Rye Wise. Chris Kirshner here. I'm Vice President of Public Policy and Economic Development for the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce. You've been there for a while, haven't you? I have 10 years now, Reverend. 10 years. It, it, and the time has flown by. You know, it's, it was great uh, when I was able to come back to the community I was born and raised in uh, to, help, uh, to help advance this community and, uh, and, uh, and, have, and take it to some new levels. So it's been, it's been good to be back home amongst friends. Did you go to school here? I did. I, I was a Kettering guy. Grew up in Kettering. I uh, went to Fairmont, went to Wright State. Then I did a little tour duty around the country and uh, went out to Washington, D.C. and Columbus, Ohio, and then ended up back here 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Yeah. And, and what was your first job with the chamber? First job was the job I have. I was the vice, came in as the vice president of public policy and economic development back in 2005. And so you've had uh, brought some wars uh, at the state house. Yeah, we have. We have. You know, in my role, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the chief lobbyist for the organization, so I spend a lot of time in Columbus. Uh, I have an office up there as well as here in Dayton uh, to make sure that, um, you know, folks in the legislature know about issues that are important to the Dayton area business community uh, and that uh, they have a contact here if they ever have questions on what, how legislation they're considering is going to impact uh, folks in this community, they know they have some somebody they can reach out to that's real close. So yeah, it's fun. I really enjoy it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great time uh, 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 helping advance a lot of the causes that are important to the Dayton business community. Speaking of the Dayton business community, how's it doing? It's doing well. We've had some great wins. Uh, you know, we've got Fu Yao that should be starting production here within a week, uh, and they've said they're going to have up to 2,000 jobs in the old GM plant. Uh, you know, logistics and distribution is doing tremendous in this area. When you have the crossroads of I-70 and I-75, you have the CSX rail line, you have an international airport all within three miles of each other, logistics companies take notice. And that's why P&G opened up their new facility with 1,000 jobs up by the airport. You got Caterpillar doing their distribution with 600 jobs by the airport. You got Payless Shoes by the airport doing their North American distribution operations with 500 jobs. You see a lot of these types of companies that are moving to this area, uh, and these are good jobs, good jobs that you could raise a family on, uh, attractive jobs for maybe folks that were displaced from automotive jobs, uh, and they are really part of our core niche here in the Dayton area. Mm -hmm. And a good place for small businesses, too, I understand. Oh, absolutely. You know, Dayton is founded on a spirit of innovation and entrepreneurism. 
and uh, small businesses really thrive here because we have a culture that supports it. We have a culture that supports risk-taking, that supports small businesses uh, and their innovation. Uh, you know, that you could see that because we're, I mean, from some of our history, you know. I mean, it, it's by no accident that Dayton was the home of the Wright brothers. We had a culture then that supported a spirit of innovation and entrepreneurism, and we have a culture now that supports innovation and entrepreneurism. And you're seeing a lot of that as it's related to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base now and uh, defense work as the Department of Defense is looking for small business contractors to come up with new and innovative ways to protect our country. And we have businesses right here in the Dayton region that are meeting that demand. Do you think Ohio is doing as well as Dayton overall? Um, I think Ohio has been doing very well. I think Ohio has definitely been bouncing back. I think Dayton has been doing extremely well. Um, our our unemployment numbers have been trending just slightly better than the states. I think the state's made up of a diversity of areas. You know, you have you have eight major metropolitan areas in the state, but then you also have some rural areas in the state. So there, you're going to see different economic trends depending on which part of the state you live in or you're, you're analyzing. Uh, but Ohio's been doing well. Uh, under Governor Kasich, uh, we've had some very strong job gains. Uh, I think he, he and uh, his team have done a good job of putting Ohio on a strong path. Um, but there's still room to grow, and I think we're continuing to do that. Uh, but I think Dayton's been trending just a little bit better. As soon as we get some of these orange batter, barrels around here, I think the better, but that's just the cost of uh, living in a modern age, isn't it? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, uh, in full disclosure, I'm probably to blame for some of those orange barrels you see around <laughs> because the chamber, uh, one of our key strategic initiatives is to advocate for improved transportation uh, infrastructure for the region. You know, we don't. We want to make sure that as we're growing as a region and a state, we have the roadways and highways that can support our growth so that you don't have a lot of bottlenecks so that you don't have congestion. Uh, so some of those orange barrels, I got to admit, I'm at fault for it because we said, hey, these are these are projects that need to get done in the Dayton region so we can continue to be competitive uh, on a on a global stage. You got to break some concrete to have for expansion. So that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Well, sir, there's a, an election coming up in a few weeks. I heard that. And there's an issue on the ballot that's called Issue 3. That's right. And it's about creating a monopoly for commercial production and sale of marijuana for recreational and medical purposes. And one of the things we want to talk, it talks about is how that's going to affect our businesses and how that's going to affect our societies. Is there a way that you can address that? Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me talk just a little bit about the amendment um, so I can inform some of your listeners about the amendment. And then I'll talk to you about our position on the amendment. But, um, you know, so this amendment, would, you said the exact title that's been approved by uh, the Ohio Secretary of State and by the Ohio Supreme Court, uh, that this will grant a monopoly for 10 businesses for the sale of recreational medical marijuana in the state of Ohio. That, that's correct. It will do that, but it's going to do more than that. So it's going to do more than uh, just legalize medical and recreational marijuana. It, first off, it does do this monopoly that it mentions in the title. It will say in this amendment that the exclusive rights to grow, cultivate, price, and distribute the marijuana in the state of Ohio is given, being given to 10 investors that are specifically named in the Constitution. Reverend, this is the same constitution in the state of Ohio that grants freedom of religion, which I know is something important to you, uh, freedom of speech, freedom to assemble, uh, prohibits slavery. You know, it, it, it gives you your basic rights for a foundation of a government. And now we have a special interest group that's wanting to use it as a political football for their own profit-making opportunity. Um, if, if, if legalizing marijuana is something people want to do, it is absolutely the wrong way to do it by putting it into the state constitution. Uh, this constitution, like I said, is a foundation for government. It should not be used for, to advance these types of initiatives. Um, the 10 companies, the 10 investors that are going to be named in the constitution all wrote a check for $2 million each to this campaign to get this on the ballot. So this campaign is $20 million. And it's being paid for by the investors. And the reason why these rich investors are paying for this uh, to be on the ballot is because it is projected that this will be a $1 billion annual industry. And that was a billion with a B, I said. $1 billion annual 
profit industry for uh, these marijuana growers. That's a lot of Ohioans' money uh, that is projected to go towards this initiative, and that's why these folks wrote their own amendment uh, with their, uh, with their, them specifically named as the folks that would have the sole rights to grow, distribute, and price marijuana. Now, the other thing this, this really goes in the face of is what we were talking about earlier. Dayton has had a strong history of entrepreneurism and innovation. Well, if somebody wanted to start their own marijuana farm in Dayton, they would be prohibited from doing that because they would be not be named in the Constitution. So this really flies in the face of free enterprise and entrepreneurism and goes against uh, really the, the capitalistic principles that our country and our state were founded on. Now that's, now that's just the monopoly. I haven't gotten into the social issues or the health care issues that uh, will be a part of this. One of the things that's very concerning uh, to folks as well is the fact that this will legalize edibles, edible candies laced with marijuana in the state of Ohio. This is included in part of the, in part of the amendment. This is not me uh, you know, taking something out of context. It actually says directly in the amendment that these edibles will be legalized in the state. Uh, and edibles include uh, gummy bears, cookies, brownies, candy bars, all laced with 10 to 40 times the amount of THC that somebody would find in a normal uh, joint, a uh, normal marijuana cigarette. Um, so these are extremely potent candies. What's most concerning about this is the fact that candies are something that's attractive to children. And, you know, children uh, are, I have two kids of my own, and, you know, if I've got a bag of gummy bears laying out on the table, those kids are pretty likely to walk by and try to grab a handful of those gummy bears and eat them. Uh, kids love candy. Heck, I love candy. Um, but the fact that, that we'll have this candy in Ohio now that is laced with marijuana and there could be, uh, you know, irresponsible adults that leave it laying around the house and children will have access to it is very, very scary. Colorado, which legalized edibles, saw a 72% increase in poison control exposures for children because of marijuana in 2014. You know, I mean, that, that really scares me as a parent and scares me for the future of Ohio, uh, you know, especially because we're coming up on Halloween right now. And I would really hate to see a child get a marijuana gummy bear placed in their, uh, in their, in their trick-or-treat bag. First time that happens, you're going to see the lawsuits flying, and you're going to see uh, some very concerned parents uh, maybe reconsidering why they would have supported this initiative. So there, there's a lot of things uh, in this amendment that are, that are scary. Uh, you know, the business community has a lot of concerns uh, for the workforce issues. Uh, there's actually a part of this amendment that says folks with a medical marijuana certificate will legally be able to use marijuana in the workplace for medical purposes. Well, employers like to have drug-free workplace policies, and now the Constitution will say that they have to allow folks with a medical marijuana certificate to use in the workplace. So employers have to make a decision. Are they going to violate the Constitution to uphold their drug-free workplace policy? Are they going to violate the drug-free workplace policy to uphold the Constitution? Either way, those employers are probably going to have a legal lawsuit on their hands, which is going to cost them a lot of money, which is going to prevent them from hiring other people, uh, may even make it unattractive for them to operate biz uh, businesses here in the state of Ohio. Colorado has seen businesses actually leaving the state because of marijuana, uh, because their employees were coming in high, because they had to do drug screening, they had to do an increased drug screening test, uh, because their production and the quality of the products that they were manufacturing was going down. They've actually had businesses that are leaving. Ohio has made some great strides lately, and we are definitely uh, on the upswing, the economic upswing. And if this issue were to pass, it would just take us that many steps backwards. So uh, there, there's, there's a lot of concerns here. Um, if, you know, the, the proponents, the backers of this marijuana bill are trying to use the medical piece to carry the recreational, the monopoly, and the edible parts of this across the goal line. And that's not wrong. That's, that's not right. That's wrong to Ohio voters. It's disrespectful to Ohio voters uh, that they are leveraging the fact that uh, some folks claim that medical has been good for uh, their health, and they're using those claims to carry the rest of this across the goal line. And that's just, that's just not the right way to advance an initiative, no matter what the initiative is. One of the elements of this issue, buried deep in the back, 
is something that states it limits the ability of the legislator and the local governments from regulating the manufacture, sale, distributing, and use of marijuana and marijuana products. It creates a new state government agency called the Marijuana Control Commission with limited authority to regulate the industry, comprised of seven Ohio residents appointed by the governor, including a physician, a law enforcement officer, administrative law attorney, a patient advocate, and a resident experiencing and owning and developing and managing and operating a business, a resident with experience in the legal marijuana industry, and a member of the public. That is, once you get it in, it's a trap to me. Once you get it in, you can't you can't modify it. You can't change it. You can't, you know, it's given a number of people extremely amount of power over over this issue and over this manufacturing and development of, of marijuana and marijuana products. Yeah, you're, I find that just scary. Yeah, you're exactly right. This, I mean, when you lock something into the Constitution, the only way it can be changed is by another vote of the entire voter vo uh, voting public of the state of Ohio. It can't be changed by the legislature. So, you know, every year, Reverend, I know you spend a lot of time in Columbus advancing your initiatives. Um, you know that the state considers a, a biennial budget, a biennium budget, in which they, they budget appropriately uh, for the economic needs of the state for the upcoming fiscal year. Well, when they do that, they're able to adjust things and change things to uh, meet the economic needs of the state. Uh, you know, something we saw recently was an adjustment in some sin taxes, an increase in cigarette taxes, uh, and, you know, maybe an increase in alcohol taxes. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, we as a state don't prohibit cigarettes and alcohol, but we realize that there are probably some uh, social ills that come from those uh, substances. So as the state legislature has decided to increase taxes on those to help recoup some of the costs that local governments and local communities are paying for folks that may have uh, substance abuse issues. And we wouldn't be able to do that as a state if this was put in the Constitution because it would lock those tax rates into the state constitution. So it would tax the marijuana, but would lock it into the constitution. So if we decided five years from now that we wanted to raise the taxes on marijuana, we couldn't do it in the budgeting process like we do for everything else. It would have to go back to another vote of the people and again be locked in just like your marijuana control commission that you that you mentioned. Uh, it would be it would be permanently in stone in the constitution, unable to be changed. And once it get in, gets in, it's going to be very difficult to get it back out, isn't it? That's exactly right. Um, that's exactly right. Uh, you know, it, this is uh, this just is not the right way to do it. it the, you know, if folks want to advance marijuana in the state of Ohio, then they should talk to the state legislature about it. I mean, that's the right body to consider this, uh, not the state constitution. Uh, like I said, the constitution's set up for uh, you know a foundation of government. Uh, like I mentioned, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, prohibiting slavery, not whether or not you can smoke weed. That's just ridiculous that that's going to be in the Constitution. Yeah, and people also don't realize the people that are going to be distributing this stuff are not like licensed pharmacies, but retail operations like Starbucks. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there would actually be, it says in this amendment, Reverend, that Ohio could have one marijuana retail store for every 10,000 people. That means we can have 1,100 marijuana retail stores in the state of Ohio. There are 203 Starbucks in the state of Ohio. So this is over five times the number of Starbucks that will have marijuana stores in this state. So there will be one on every corner. You know, the joke is there's a Starbucks on every corner. Well, there's going to be five times the amount of Starbucks on every corner uh, if you compare those to marijuana retail stores. Um, so these places would be everywhere. They'd be in everybody's communities. They'd be in your backyard. Uh, you know, they'd be something that you pass on the way to church or on the way to school, uh, and that's not right. That's not something I want my family exposed to. That's not something a lot of people in this state want their families exposed to. Uh, you know, we already have a, a bad enough problem in this state and in our own community with substance abuse issues. Uh, for legal and illegal substances. If we create greater access to an intoxicating substance, those problems are only going to get worse. They're not going to get better. 
and that's something that's very concerning uh, as a as a member of this community, as a member of the faith community, as a member of uh, as a member of uh, the Dayton business community. You know, we I don't want to see more people with substance abuse issues. Let alone you're working on the job and suddenly someone hands you a gummy bear. Right. And next thing you know, you're up for a drug test and you test positive. Right. And what are you going to do? And suddenly your whole world's going to fall apart on you. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, you know, we, uh, there's a lot of unintended consequences that could happen because of this. Uh, not to mention the fact that if it does get legalized, you're going to have a lot of individuals that think because it's been legalized, now I can just go out and smoke and do whatever I want. And they're not going to realize that there is a lot of repercussions that could happen because of the fact that uh, they're, they're using marijuana. You know, one of the things employers are really scared about too is right now there's no good way to test for impairment with marijuana. Now, you can test and see if it's in your system. So if an employer, if a boss suspects that his, his or her employee is high, they can test their blood and see if there's marijuana in their system. If that test comes back positive, all it tells you is there's marijuana in their system. And marijuana stays in the system for up to two weeks. So that employer has no idea if that employee smoked a joint an hour before they came into work or if they smoked it a week ago. And that employer now has to make a decision on whether they want to terminate that employee or allow that employee to continue to be at work and possibly be high on the job, possibly be operating a forklift or be driving a vehicle. You know, either way, that employer is going to have to make a decision uh, that could result in, uh, in an illegal challenge and cost them millions of dollars and make it unattractive for Ohio uh, for them to operate in Ohio. Every federal job is zero tolerance. I believe, on drugs. Yeah, that's right, because this is still an illegal drug on the federal level. So if Ohio was to legalize this, federal government still says, nope, still an illegal Schedule One illegal drug according to the federal government. So anybody that's regulated by the federal government, truck drivers are regulated by the U.S. Department of Transportation, banking and financial industries are regulated um, by the federal government, they will have to have a zero-tolerance policy because the federal government says, I don't care what Ohio said. It's still illegal according to us. And since you're partly governed by us, you, you have to have a zero tolerance policy. It is more and more sounding like a trap for us to fall into that we need to avoid and, and vote no on this issue. It really is. Uh, you know, I, I, this, is, this is a problem. It is not the right way to do it. If there are folks out there that believe in the merits of medical marijuana, then they need to vote no on issue three and talk to their talk to the legislature about considering a medical marijuana bill. Um, this is not the way to do it by putting it into our constitution. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is just not the right way. Putting a monopoly for any business into the constitution is the wrong way to go. Uh, you know, I mean. This this just is it's completely inappropriate. It's disrespectful to the Ohio people, uh, and it flies in the face of free enterprise and fair market competition. Something that uh, we all support. You know, fair fair market competition uh, allows companies to produce a better product, keeps prices lower for consumers. When you put a monopoly in, uh, you price you can. There's the uh, opportunity for price fixing. There's the opportunity. Uh, for uh, having, since you have the sole rights to grow and distribute, there's the, uh, just the opportunity to abuse the process. And that's not right to, to the state, and that's not right to consumers. Um, this monopoly is really scary, and it's not that we shouldn't use our Constitution as a, uh, as a vehicle to advance profits for 10 rich investors that all wrote a check for $2 million each to put this on the ballot. As a side issue, how does issue two affect issue three? So issue two, here's how issue two and issue three are, are somewhat related. Issue two uh, was put on the ballot as a constitutional amendment as well uh, in reaction to issue three. Uh, and what issue two says, it says, in the future, no special interest uh, should be allowed to put a monopoly, an oligopoly, or a cartel into the state constitution without first seeking 
voter approval. Uh, you know, this so basically what it does. Issue two is a good thing. Uh, people should vote yes on issue two because issue two will make these types of monopoly amendments very harder, much harder in the future uh, for any special interest. You know, we need to send a clear message to special interest groups that our constitution cannot be bought. And that's what issue two does. Issue two creates a two-step process for, for anybody that wants to consider putting one of these monopolies into the state constitution, and it makes it a lot harder for special interests to try to get these monopolies into the constitution. So issue two is something we should support. Um, and uh, the other thing with issue two is issue two says uh, that if issue two passes and issue three passes, that issue two would nullify issue three. So issue two is a good thing because it will also prevent uh, issue three if it passed from going into effect. So uh, I would urge uh, all of your listeners to please vote yes on issue two and no on issue three. Uh, and then there, actually there's a whole other amendment uh, Reverend, that we're supportive of too, which is issue one, which is uh, redistricting reform for how the legislative maps are drawn in the state of Ohio, and we think voters should vote yes on that as well. So if I can make it real simple for your for your listeners, vote yes on one and two, vote no on three. Is it uh, there's another uh, money issue on the ballot in the uh, Dayton area? There is another issue. I believe it's uh, I know issue thirteen, which is a Sinclair levy, uh, is on the ballot. Yeah. And uh, that's something, uh, you know, we're, we're very supportive of. Uh, Sinclair, you know, is probably one of the lowest cost community colleges in the state of Ohio and the best community college in the entire country. And it's right here in our own backyard. Uh, and they educate tens of thousands of students every year. Uh, it's a great uh, education opportunity for young students as well as for working adults. Uh, and they really help to meet a lot of the job demands of this community. Uh, so we'd really like to see that Sinclair levy get passed. A lot of successful people in the Dayton area, when you talk to them about their success and about their job experience, they, a lot of them say, well, I started taking classes at Sinclair. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did. I started at Sinclair a long time ago. Really? Uh, when I first came out of school, I spent some time there, and I loved my experience at Sinclair. Uh, I was there before I transferred over to Wright State, so it's, it's a great school. Well, sir, we've been talking for quite a while now. Is there anything in this interview that you wanted to add that I had not thought to, to bring up? You know, I think, Reverend, you've covered a lot of the issues well. Uh, I think people just need to make sure uh, when they're going in the going to vote on November 3rd, and we, I ask your listeners to please go out and vote on November 3rd, um, that, that, that they think long and hard about these issues because – uh, you know, legalizing marijuana and putting a monopoly into the state constitution is not the right path for Ohio right now. Um, it just is not the right way for us to go. So I would hope that, that your listeners vote no on issue three, and they vote yes on issues one and two, uh, and then vote yes on the Sinclair levy. All right. And also, if you want to know about more about the Dayton Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. Uh, actually, you can always visit the Dayton Chamber webpage, which is Dayton Chamber dot org uh, or if you want to learn more about the marijuana issue uh, we have a whole website dedicated to that it's called dreamdayton.com so dreamdayton.com dream stands for dayton regional employers against marijuana uh, if you go to dreamdayton.com we have we have a full printout of the bill there we have resources information uh, speakers bureau really any information you're looking for it's all there on that website all right, sir. Give your name one more time and your title. Chris Kirshner, Vice President of Public Policy and Economic Development for the Dayton Area Chamber of Commerce. This is Reverend Thomas Wise, and the show is called Politically Wise. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Thank you for listening today. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. Now, here is your blessing. Blessings based on Psalms chapter 29 verses 1 through 2. May you be in awe of God's might. May you be 
in all of God's glory. May you be in all of God's power. May you know God's strength. May you give glory to God's name. May you worship the Lord. May you know the splendor of his holiness. For who is mightier than God? For who is greater than God? Who is holier than God? There is none but God.